Hello, and good evening. I want to welcome you to how UAS contributes to some of the best salmon data in the world. My name is Jesse Post, and I'm the Alumni Relations Manager here, and also representing the Alumni and Friends Association at UAS. Um, and we are excited to be hosting with faculty member Dave Tallman and Scott Volstek from the National Marine Fisheries Service. Um, there are a lot of amazing UAS stories to tell, and it's the mission of the Alumni Association to, um, to help share those impactful stories and bring community and alumni together. And tonight there are a few ways, or not necessarily tonight, but if you feel like this presentation has inspired you at all, there are a few ways you can support UAS. Um, the first is you can become an Alumni and Friends member, and it helps support putting on lectures and events like this and uh, raising scholarships for students. I can tell you more about that if you have questions. Um, and then you, the second thing is that you, if you feel inclined, you can also support the Oak Creek Research, or the Oak Creek uh, Student Internship Program. And that's a program that is really only funded by private support. Um, Donors um, support the Oak Creek students, that we have a few of them here today. Um, and uh, those, <laughs> those funds help support them through stipends, and um, they, they perform research, and they're counting fish, and you'll hear a little bit more about what these students are doing um, on a daily basis during the summer months uh, at the Oak Creek Weir, which is right around the corner here from UAS. Um, and then I just want to acknowledge Alaska Glacier Seafoods and Dye Pack. They both have contributed $20,000 over the past five years, and they've helped these students um, and these research efforts. So I just want to give a shout out to them. They've been a great supporter of this program. Um, and then I think before we go any further, I'd just like to introduce uh, Professor Dave Tallman over here. And Dave is a professor of biology at UAS. Um, he's passionate about uh, salmon population genetics, evolution, and conservation research. And um, he has really fostered a great partnership between UAS and um, the National Marine Fisheries Service, which is why Scott is here. Um, and he's been leading uh, the, the students at Oak Creek uh, for, for quite a while now. So thank you all for being here. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Dave, and let's welcome him. Thanks, Jesse. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming out. This is going to be a, a joint effort, as Jesse mentioned, between Scott and myself. So we'll pass the mic back and forth, talk a little bit about this program and how UAS contributes to these data. Uh, if you look at the slide that's up right now, you can see two students, uh, Trevor and Patrick, who worked at the Weir this last summer. And what the Weir does for our students is it provides students with hands-on research opportunities and we try to foster them being involved not just in data collection, which is what we help the National Marine Fisheries Service with, but also with individual research projects so they can understand how science is done and understand the creative side of science as well as the uh, drudgery of collecting data day in and day out. Um, I'll give away the punchline and why these are such great data right off the bat, and that's because all the fish that go in and out of Oak Creek, all the salmon and trout and char that go in and out of Oak Creek are handled and counted individually. And so it provides a data set that's unequaled for wild populations anywhere. There are places where fish are counted and enumerated completely, uh, but those places tend to be uh, associated with hydropower and hatcheries. And so there aren't wild populations like this one where every fish is counted. And that's really helpful for doing a lot of science if you know exactly how many fish there are rather than having to estimate it based on data, which gives you less confidence in your answer. Uh, okay, uh, let's take it from there. There's a few projects that I'm just not going to have time to talk about tonight, but I want to mention them because they're, uh, they help illustrate some of the things that you can do at Oak Creek Queer that you can't do a lot of other places. So there's a project going on at Oak Creek Queer looking at sockeye enhancement, and uh, that relates to uh, Pacific Salmon Treaty relationships between the U.S. and Canada. Uh, there's also an ongoing project looking at adaptation of pink salmon to warming temperatures that we've seen 
in Oak Creek over time. Uh, we also just received a grant to look at uh, the Jack life history or the focus on a little bit uh, after we talk a bit about the history of Oak Creek Weir is on the use of environmental DNA to determine escapement or the number of spawning fish. And this is an example of how the detailed data that are collected at Oak Creek Weir allow us to do something that's not possible or easy anyway to do elsewhere. And before we get too far into it, I just want to throw up a smattering of some of the students who have been at the Weir over the years and contributed, some of whom are uh, locals. Uh, I mentioned uh, Patrick New, the first slide, who's here tonight. Uh, also here tonight is Josh Russell, you see right here, who actually came to the Weir first as a high school student right out of uh, ANSAP program and got involved with the Weir and he's just recently finished his masters uh, and used data from Oak Creek Weir along the way. And then there's a host of other students who have been involved, uh, s some even a local politician who uh, started out at the Weir. Uh, but uh, there's been about, at least since I've been involved in this project, 13 different undergraduates who've been gone through the Weir. We've had I think four of them go on to graduate programs after working at the Weir. One who's actually a postdoc at Cambridge University. They've been involved in published research, so several publications have come out as a result, and I'll talk about one of them tonight, of their, as a result of, in part of their efforts at the Weir. So it's a real opportunity for these students to get engaged in research and be launched into a research path if that's what they choose. We've also had students who have gone on and done other things as well. Obviously, uh, we make mistakes and produce politicians once in a while as well. So uh, I'll maybe start on the history of Oak Creek. So there are testimonials that suggest that part of the reason uh, the Oak Kwan Clinket came to this area was because of the sockeye run in Oak Lake. So they moved up here from the Stikeen, and uh, one of the attractions of where they settled, which is out at Oak Rec, um, was the fact that there were summer runs of sockeye in Oak Lake. Um, we also know that people uh, had interest in using it for commercial purposes going back to the early 1900s. So there's a picture on the left that you see there, which is the, uh, an early hatchery that was set up by uh, those two individuals you see there. Ultimately, they weren't allowed to produce fish and use that for profit. They were denied by the federal government the ability to do what they intended. Um, but there was also a, a, a hatchery. It's not a great picture, but there's a hatchery right here. Here's the mouth of of Oak Creek, and here's where we are right now. Uh, but there was a hatchery uh, that was uh, made use of Oak Creek salmon back in the early 1900s as well. And then you can see the modern weir here. So I think I'll, I'll hand it off right now and, and uh, to Scott, and he can talk a little bit more about this whole thing. Thanks, Dave. And thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit more about the history um, leading up to what the weir is today, talk a little bit about some of the capabilities we have, some of the baseline data we collect, and how, uh, how students have been helping us collect those data for the last several years. So the weir structure um, started out with some early temporary weirs, some fish traps, things like that, starting in the, um, in the 50s. Uh, the first small hatchery building was built down in Oak Creek. And there were a, lot, a number of temporary flight traps and temporary weirs and things like that that were installed at various times over the years. And um, those worked uh, for a lot of projects, but one of the major problems is that in huge high flow events, those structures would blow out. And that also happens to be when you have a lot of fish migration occurring. So you tend to miss some of those big peaks in migration when you have these smaller temporary structures in place. And then uh, they also wanted to in the early 70s, upgrade their hatchery, their fish producing capabilities down at Oak Creek. So they built the, the footprint of what is the current hatchery building there in 1971, you can see on the left. And so since that time, uh, we've installed a permanent weir structure that went in in 1979. That's what you see over there on the left hand side. And it started fishing in 1980. So that means this year, 2019, is 40 continuous years of um, pretty incredible census data of all, like Dave said, all the, all the salmon, all the trout, all the char coming and going upstream. 
which is pretty phenomenal. And as you can see, this is a big, uh, it's concrete pad, it's all big I-beam construction, and so this thing holds up in heavy floods and allows us to keep counting fish throughout those types of events. And then along with the upgrade to the weir structure, over time they've upgraded the hatchery building itself, and so we have a, it's not like your die pack type of a facility, it's just a small experimental hatchery, so all the, any hatchery work we do at Oak Creek is just experimental based, um, individual projects. So we're not raising fish every year, and when we do, it's for a specific experimental purpose. So throughout the year, um, these are the species that we encounter. Um, so the weir is installed uh, lately mid-February, and we start to collect juvenile fish. So the pink salmon fry come out first, um, followed shortly thereafter by migrating dolly varden and cutthroat trout. And then we start to see our smolt species, our coho, just a little bit before our sockeye, and all those species migrate out to saltwater. Then sometime around mid-June, those smolt species tail off, and the adult sockeye start to come back. And so we were able to flip the configuration of our weir from a downstream capture mode to an upstream capture mode, and then we start to collect those adult fish. So the sockeye are the first salmon species we see back. Uh, Dolly varden and cutthroat migrate and follow pulses of salmon throughout the season. Uh, then we see our pink salmon, and then finally, in usually middle of August to early September, we start to see our first coho. And then we'll keep the weir in until somewhere around the end of October. So, like I said before, that gives us a complete census of these fish coming and going uh, since 1980, with other data before that, when I talked about those temporary weirs. So there are data that exist uh, well before that time. And what we're collecting at a base level is just daily migration, just counts. Uh, we're looking at sex of the fish. We're subsampling fish for age, or er, for uh, length. We're taking scales so we can look at age and growth information. And we take quite a few genetic samples. So here you can see a basket full of pink salmon fry. So that's one of the things that makes this really unique is we're able to capture all those, all those teeny tiny little pink fry, which is difficult to do. So we also coated wire tag all of our coho and serve as a, an indicator stock for management of coho in southeast Alaska. Fishing Game uses that information. Uh, so here you can see a couple of former interns uh, helping tag some fish. So they're instrumental in being able to coat a wire tag all of those coho that come out. And we also, along, this, along with that, we're able to look at timing data, and then we collect some basic environmental data, creek temperature and discharge and things like that. So here's just a little picture of our spring weir. This is what it looks like. Sometimes it's nice, like on the left-hand side, and then sometimes when you're putting it in in early February, it ends up looking like it does on the right, and things freeze up, and that's just the way it goes. So and then when we flip to our adult weir for the summer and fall, it looks something like this. So the, the creek level gets dropped, and these fence pieces go in, and they block all the fish and funnel them into a fish trap. Um, which on the right-hand picture side you can see in the lower left. And then you can see the types of floods that the structure is able to withstand. So that was a pretty, a pretty gnarly flood there. Um, and it's able to, like right now, the rains we've had, it still is able to capture fish and work efficiently and effectively. So these are the types of data we're collecting every day. We're down there every day from mid-February until the end of October, and so um, it's myself with Noah and Josh Russell, a former um, former student intern, now contracting with Noah. He and I are he and I are down there, and so it's great having students to help us out throughout the season. Otherwise, Josh and I would get extremely weird. So if we were the only ones down there doing this stuff, so it's great having these students. Uh, they help us out a lot, collecting these data. Uh, we're able to do more sampling, um, do more tagging all those sorts of things, and then along with that, the students are able to develop their own uh, individual research projects, and I think you know, they get a lot out of it as well. So a lot of experience in the field, fish ID, um, some lab analyses, some data analysis, and some scientific writing and things like that. So it's been a great partnership in my opinion. So with that, I think I'm gonna hand it back to Dave, talk a little bit about a couple of the other projects. So uh, 
mentioned the fact that we're able to count every single fish, which gives us a great ability to detect subtleties in the populations that, that are difficult to detect with other types of data where you have to do lots of estimations about how many individuals are there. And one of the more striking patterns that we've seen over the course of the time series is that the fish are moving to earlier and earlier migration in and out of the system. So it can be fairly uh, small shift or it could be uh, a fairly large shift. So in the case of coho salmon, the returning adults are now migrating back three weeks earlier than they did when we started collecting data that at, the, at the beginning, right back in 1980. So, you know, there can be some pretty dramatic shifts. And this earlier migration makes some sense if you think about the fact that they're, with these fish, their metabolic rates, developmental rates, those sorts of things are greatly affected by ambient temperature. And as you elevate temperature, you speed things up, so things would migrate earlier. So that's a possible reason why they're doing this, but it's consistent with the idea that over time we're seeing an increase in stream temperatures in Oak Creek and then this, this earlier migration pattern across a host of different species and stage in, stages in their life history. The other thing that's interesting that we're seeing in Oak Creek <coughs> is a, a compressed range of dates over with over which the adults are returning to spawn. So if you look from the first sockeye to come in to the last coho to come in, the r range of dates over which they're migrating is now 30 days shorter than it was when the time series started. So there's been both a shift towards earlier migration and a compression in the range of dates over which that occurs. Um, so those are some of the long-term uh, patterns and, and interesting phenomena we've seen. And we've got some understanding for various species about why that's happening and, and and um, some evidence in the case, say, of pink salmon for genetic changes or evolutionary changes in the population as they're shifting their migration timing. But that's not what I want to talk about today. Um, what I want to talk about today is, is, is an example of how these data from Oak Creek are extremely useful. So um, recently, we were able to collaborate with partners from a host of different places that uh, at least I don't normally get to collaborate uh, with. So uh, scientists from the Chinese Academy of Science, Sciences, Oregon State University, East Anglia, uh, of course, NOAA, and, and ourselves. And we uh, embarked upon a project looking at what's called eDNA or an environmental DNA. And this is a hot topic because it basically gets to the idea that for a lot of species that are difficult to count or observe for one reason or another, everything leaves behind DNA, and if there's some way you can relate the amount of DNA you could collect from that organism to the number of individuals that are actually present, that provides a really powerful way to understand something about a species that's cryptic or secretive, or in the case of fish, uh, in water. So uh, we embarked on this project, and, and, and the idea was because we're at Ock Creek where we know exactly how many fish are being released upstream every day, we have exact counts of how many fish have been detected and released. And the question then becomes, could we simply sample the water downstream from those fish and use a simple model to estimate how many fish are upstream based on how much of their DNA we collect in water samples below them? So basic idea is every day fish are released from the weir. They swim upstream. You could go out and collect a water sample. You can take DNA in that water filter out the DNA, and then use what's called quantitative PCR to infer how much DNA you got, and then ask whether or not that information can correctly tell you how many fish you know you released, right? So can you predict how many fish you released and you know you released uh, using DNA? And again, the reason we're able to do that at Oak Creek is because we know how many fish are upstream, right? A lot of places you don't know how many fish are upstream, or you know how many fish, plus or minus a few thousand. And in this case, we know how many we've just released. And this qPCR, I'm not going to get into the, the, the idiosyncrasies of it, but the basic idea is that um, it's sort of like if you put money in a bank account and you didn't know how much money you put in, but you knew how much interest you had in the time period over which it was in the bank, you could infer how much you started with. And that's how qPCR works. Basically, you collect a bunch of DNA at the end of this process, and you know how fast that DNA grew in abundance through the process you used, that tells you how much DNA you started with. 
So that's the basic idea behind this qPCR. And the fundamental question that we're trying to get at with this is basically, could somebody go out uh, like Donovan Bell, or no, that's, is that Padraig? That's Padraig. And collect a water sample once a day and give us as much information about how many fish there are as a whole crew of people working on a weir every day in western Alaska and Bristol Bay or someplace like that. So uh, to get right to the uh, punchline is we were amazed by how well this works. So uh, this shows for 2015 and 2016 for sockeye and coho. Again, we know how many fish we're releasing every day. And that's shown in the black uh, dotted lines that you see here. And then we were able to predict uh, using uh, a very s simple regression model and information on eDNA count and stream flow, we were able to predict quite well how many fish we actually did release using a very simple model. And you can see here, there's some uh, variation, but overall it fits pr pretty good, and it's especially good in 2016 when we, went, when we went out and sampled eDNA every day rather than sampling sometimes just every three days as we did in 2015. So remarkable fit between the, what we know to be true and what we estimated using these DNA data. Um, and cool thing is that this just came out in a paper um, with all those collaborators. I'll just highlight there's a couple of students who at the time we did this project were undergraduates who were involved uh, in doing this project. So of course, this result is somewhat tantalizing because it suggests that there might be a fairly cheap way to go out and infer escapement or number of fish that are uh, in a spawning aggregation using a sample of water if you know something about the flow rate in that stream and uh, are able to quantify the DNA. So it seems like a way that for something is roughly a half billion dollar industry in Southeast Alaska, that is salmonid fisheries, um, you could use a small number of people to sample a wide geographic area and at least be able to detect peaks in migration in a bunch of different streams uh, fairly cheaply and economically. It also creates a possibility for citizen scientists to go out and collect something as simple as a water sample that's filtered and then taken to the lab to try to infer how many fish are in a stream. So, um, that's just one example. Um, and so I would argue that um, you know, there's a long history of, of research that's gone on in Auk Creek. And we've just talked about a little bit of it here. And there's a long history of, of activity at Auk Creek. And it's amazing to me that there are thousands of Junoites who drive by the Auk Creek Weir who don't even know that it exists. I mean, it's just over the lip of Glacier Highway, and I'm astounded by every day how many people I, I run into who have no idea that we have this amazing thing down here at the Oak Creek, uh, at the mouth of Oak Creek, and that it provides data that are of such high quality, they're really unequaled anywhere that I know of. Um, and that information is used in salmon management, as Scott mentioned, with looking at coho harvest um, in fisheries, as, as well as marine survival. There's been roughly uh, 70 graduate theses that have been done at Oak Creek over the course of the history. Um, as I mentioned, we've had a large number of undergraduates who've also been engaged in published research that's gone on there. And then finally, another thing that I think is important to bring up about the weir is that it ends up being an economic engine. So we just got a grant that I mentioned to look at this Jack Life history of coho salmon. And the only reason we were able to get that grant is because we have these detailed data about the number of salmon going in and out, whether they're jacks or full-sized males, and we also have collected genetic samples from those individuals. And we have data over such a long period that we're able to look at offspring and their reproductive success in terms of the number of returning offspring that come back to the weir. And that's something that's simply not possible in most places. And so we have incredible options. Or um, for our research, and that allows us to apply for grants in this case that then come in and support uh, this research and ends up 
being funneled into the community as we buy supplies for all the things we do and pay salaries of, of people who work doing these projects. So uh, I also want to leave you with something to think about. Um, and one question that might come to mind is why should anyone care about Auk Creek uh, in terms of fisheries in Alaska? And that's a valid question because it's not a massive uh, producer of salmon for harvest, right? So we generally have on the order of a few thousand uh, fish. By far the most common of the species there is pink salmon, and there's obviously high volatility in the number of spawning individuals that come back there. But I think there's arguments for places like Auk Creek being really important to the long-term stability of salmon. And so this is just to illustrate this idea. And uh, the reason I put in this figure is because it comes from uh, Dan Doak, who's actually uh, was born and raised in Alaska. He's now a professor at CU Boulder. But back in 1998, he argued that essentially ecological communities are more stable if they're more diverse. That is, if they have more species in them, they tend to be more stable communities, just like if you have a stock portfolio that's diverse, it tends to be more stable because even though individual stocks may be rising and falling, or in this case, individual species, overall, you have a nice, steady portfolio. He argued that that was the case and almost inevitable in ecological communities. Uh, eventually, uh, some work was done using a really rich data set of salmon over in Bristol Bay by Daniel Schindler, who in 2010 published a paper looking at the portfolio effect but just applied to Bristol Bay sockeye salmon. And what he and his collaborators showed is that because you have hundreds of different populations contributing to the overall catch, you have a catch that's 10 times more stable than if you had a single, or uh, sorry, two and a half, almost two and a half times more stable than if you had a single population and its oscillations contributing to the catch. And you have 10 times fewer closures of fisheries as a result of having this diverse portfolio of individual populations all fluctuating, not perfectly correlated. So some are going up when others are going down. And it contributes to the overall stability of the fishery and the ability to make steady money over a long time period. And so I would argue that that may be the case as well for Auk Creek contributing on a larger regional scale. If we have lots of individual populations, each of which um, has slightly different fluctuations than the other, then that contributes to the long-term stability of uh, the harvest or ability to make use of those populations. So I think uh, we'll stop there. We wanted to keep this to about a half hour, and I think we're almost spot on with that. And uh, also, uh, I was asked to put up this slide in case you want to give money to support undergraduates continuing to do this work at Oak Creek. There are at least two options there, and I'm sure they can give you other options if you'd like to donate. And with that, I think we'll stop and take questions. Also, so hi. I live on the lake, and I've been there for about 35 years. So I'm very curious about what kind of changes you're seeing based on the significant increase in motorized use on the lake, and uh, that really has increased. Plus the wave action and the installation recently of the boat launch. Thanks. So we have seen some changes in populations over time, but it's difficult for us to say, working down at the tide line, which of those may have been impacted by, you know, those factors, increased usage. So we've seen, like Dave said, these shifts in migration over time has been one of the most dramatic things that we've seen. Um, and it's hard to say there. Um, as far as population sizes and stability, um, we see our ups and downs uh, over time. Things have generally been fairly stable. The last few years, we've seen some decreases um, in both marine and freshwater survival for several species. Uh, but I can't say for sure. Um, 
on the freshwater side of things, what might be due to that? We don't, unfortunately. There has been some work that's been done there. Um, Larry was doing that for a while, I know, <laughs> on slab. Um, but I don't know offhand the results of those, the work that he did there. I would just add, I, I think even like the most dramatic I've seen in the last few years is this last summer that if you noticed uh, Lake Creek dried up, the lower part of Drake, Lake Creek had no surface water. It was all groundwater, um, whatever there was. So to me, that's even more frightening than any uh, boat use on the lake is the fact that the stream for a period when there were fish that were at least trying to get in there, um, there was no possible way they could get in there. And so if we're going to have hot and dry summers like we had, there may be some impacts uh, both on the coho and the sockeye because as far as we can tell, you know, maybe 95% of their spawning goes on in Lake Creek uh, and not in the lake. So. Just on that subject, have uh, sockeye or coho ever been radio tagged and, and uh, so you know something about their spawning distribution in the system? Yeah, there have been some studies. Um, Benita was involved in one of those. <laughs> um, and then we did another tagging study uh, my first year at Hawk Creek, which was 2011, 2012, um, where we did predominantly sockeye tagging and looked at um, the regions they use, staging areas, um, and then spawning. Unfortunately, our funding only ended up being for one year, and it was a, we were hoping to get at some of the how much lake margin spawning may go on, but in the year we ended up tagging those fish was a wet, cool summer where access to Lake Creek was pretty much unimpeded, um, and so 95% of those fish went up Lake Creek where they presumably spawned. Um, but yeah, so there has been some of that, and that's another point I was going to get at talking about lake usage. There are certainly certain areas that are very important, um, adult staging habitat and also for uh, feeding and cover areas for juvenile fish that um, certainly are impacted to some extent uh, by increased lake usage, but I just can't tell you offhand what that impact might be. But yeah, we have done a little bit of telemetry work. I guess another question. Um, are there, are, is there reports available with um, annual weir counts or whatever? There are some, and Josh is trying to push me to get the other ones out. We have some others that we'll have out soon, but there are a few um, in the past. There's NOAA technical memos, um, and we should have another couple of those coming out pretty soon. Is there any plan to look at um, the eDNA correlation um, in a, a watershed with a larger discharge and a greater uh, run? So yeah, ideally that would be great. So that's that's the problem with Oak Creek is it's a N of one. It's one system that you're looking at. Um, so you have a lot of data about this one system, but you don't in all cases know how that translates to very different systems. And so we don't as of right now, um, have a plan to do that. We were looking at some other work up in Lake Creek, but um, it would be great to expand it and look at how this performs in other systems. In certainly more complex systems, um, you're going to have additional challenges, and especially if you think about looking at a huge, you know, transboundary system like the Takwir the Stikine or something like that. Um, you know, one dip out of the main stem of that river is maybe not going to tell you that much, but um, this at least showed that there is some promise to this. Um, this idea and this technology, and certainly, yeah, we're hopeful that others will go out and try it on different systems and figure out what works and what doesn't. Yep. So you should also ask ADFG why they didn't fund our proposal to look in further. Into it. <laughs> um, but uh, just to add on to that, uh, we <clears throat> we're also really interested in doing this kind of work uh, on the Sea Tuck over on the outer coast, which is a has more species and it's just a little bit messier system to try to take it from this sort of really nicely tightly controlled example to something that's a little bit messier and so that's the next step is to try to go bigger and see if relationships hold or if they they break down we just don't know 
did you see variation like in taking samples from one side of the creek to the other or was it dissolved enough at that point that it didn't matter yeah I, I, so they were pretty much just taken like right down below the weir building and I, and I think there's so much mixing that goes on by the time they get there that it, it it's it, it doesn't really matter where you go I have a couple comments, questions. One is when I did do the um, radio tag data for the sockeye, um, which is in the late 80s, um, we found that, this was before the jet skis came, um, we did find milling areas and when the jet skis offloaded and loading is where we found milling areas, so that caused us alarm, number one. Um, my question is, the compression of the runs, um, is that correlated to water temperature in the creek or in the Gulf? And is it compression going in and coming out? Yeah, so compression is on both sides of it. Um, and then what, so we might be able to keep the runs a little bit better as well, so I'm not making sure exactly. So, so your question, was it related to uh, the Gulf or the stream temperatures? Yeah, or both, you know, Gulf of Alaska. Yeah, so we didn't find a relationship with uh, sort of large-scale temperature in the Gulf, but it was related to temperatures in Ock Creek. So, and that, you know, again, that could be because it's not, there's not a relationship or we just didn't detect it. <laughs> I, I got one more question. Yeah. And then with the eDNA, is that just economically easy to do, um, available for, you know, easy to find people who do it and then it doesn't, it doesn't cost a lot and it's easy to take quality sample data? Yeah, good questions. Um, so collecting the samples is super fast and easy and cheap. So the labor on that end is ridiculously cheap. Um, I would say on the sort of technical lab end, um, it's, it varies a great deal depending on the exact technology you use. So it, it would be possible to do it for, you know, as cheaply as 10 bucks a sample if you are set up to do it and you're just there to detect salmon and you know what you've, you know, you've got everything worked out. Um, but until you get everything worked out, it can be really, really expensive. And so this project wasn't at 10 bucks a sample, but that is quite feasible after doing projects like this. But the labor part's really cheap. That's the really attractive thing, is that anybody could go out and filter water, because you do that every time you go backpacking, right? Um, but the, once the, the, the tricky part is the lab bit. And once you have that worked out, it's pretty cheap. I'll just add one thing. One of the only issues collecting the samples is contamination is a big issue with this, since you're using such minuscule amounts of DNA. Think of what amount of DNA could be in a, you know, a liter of water. Um, so there are sterilization procedures. And it's all things you could get around as far as sampling goes, but it's definitely something that you have to consider when you're doing this. We, we see very few, which are strays from dye packs. So Oak Creek is not a not a Chinook system, it's too warm, um, but we do see occasional strays from dye pack, but not very many this year. So we always hope that the fishermen in Ock Bay mop them up for us. Thanks for coming, and if you do want to learn more or stay in touch with the Alumni Association or get some more information about um, the Oak Creek internship um, or any of the research that's going do down there at um, Oak Creek, um, there was a sign-in sheet going around, and I don't know, um, it is over here, so if you want to sign that on the way out, feel free. Um, They'll just give us your email address and we can stay in touch with you that way and provide some more information. So thanks for coming. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Scott, and have a great evening.